Dr. Mohan Gandhi. The moderators are Hamida Kuro and Sara Ansari. The duration of the session is 60 minutes. We haven't got a clock. No. I can give you an idea if you like. Yeah, we can start now. She said we can begin, yeah. Should I start then? Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, scholars, distinguished visitors. I and Sarah have the great privilege to talk to Raj Mohan Gandhi ji today. The session, as you've been told, will be 60 minutes, half of which we'll spend in chat, and half of it will be open to the audience to ask questions. Raj Mohanji is, I'm sure, very well known to you. He, I, after that brilliant keynote speech this morning, I think his fans must be, have increased a great deal here. And it was a, a, such a wonderful speech with all kinds of dimensions and with the, and the hope for the future for the subcontinent. And I hope this conversation will be similarly enlightening for us all. Raj Mohanji is, as you all know, the grandson of the great Mahatma Gandhi. He is a scholar, perhaps. Are you the scholar in the family? My he children is, don't think so. <laughs> well, he's written a lot of books which are not only good history books, but also have a, a deep understanding of the human nature of character. He is, apart from being an author or an historian, he is also concerned with moral reform, with the, with the humanitarian work, and has a long and distinguished career with, in which he has won, won many awards. He has spent a lot of time being an academic in America and also uh, is engaged in academic work in India. So today we have the honor of talking to him. Welcome, welcome to Karachi, to Pakistan. And it, it, it's a great privilege for us to be able able to talk to you here today. So I would like to start by asking, I've seen the list of your books and I read many years ago, I read your book on understanding the Muslim mind and on, and I was very impressed with the range of character and the way you treat them and discuss the character, characters. So. And then, of course, there is their latest book on the Punjab, which I had the privilege to read before, even before you have launched it. So I, as a matter of fact, I was just going to wave my own book on the Punjab for yes. children. Let me wave it. <laughs> the Children's History of Punjab by Hamid Akuro. <laughs> so Raj Mohanji has written a beautiful very substantial book on the Punjab. And I thought I'd tell him that I've also written one uh, on the Punjab, which, which by the way, is a, fills a huge gap, your book, I mean. Because as far as I know, when I was writing the children's book, I wanted some history book to uh, find out what happened there. And I couldn't find one. I don't think there was any really authoritative history of the Punjab that we, we could find in the bookshops, at least. So your, if we had your book, we would have been, it would, life would have been much easier. Anyhow, so you've written that. Now, uh, first of all, I think everybody here would also like to know, to start with first things first, is what, is it, what was it like being the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi? 
what, how, what, what sort of uh, effect would, did it have on your life? How did you live Asim, with that? I thought you were going to ask me, why did I write a book on Punjab? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that later. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, let me say what an honor it is to be talking with you and with, uh, with Sarah G and with, uh, with everybody here. Uh, I was 12 and a half when my grandfather was killed. I was going to school in Delhi, um, New Delhi, where my father was the editor of the Hindustan Times. Um, but my grandfather spent several months of his final phase uh, in New Delhi so during that time, when he was going from 76 to 78, and I was going from 10 to 12, I saw a good deal of him. And although uh, we, his grandchildren, did not have too much one-on-one -on -one time with him, because he had decided that virtually everybody in India was part of his family. Uh, but nonetheless, when we did spend time with him, or he spent time with us, he gave us unbelievable warmth and affection hugs, thumps on the back, and even though he was an old man and he was often fasting, his stroke on the back was quite memorable. Uh, and there were other things, but it was just wonderful uh, growing up, growing up uh, in proximity to him. Yeah. Well, did, it, did it affect you in the sense that you, you were aware at the time the Grand Sram Mahatma did it affect the attitude of your friends, of people in general? Well, luckily, my school friends completely ignored the fact that I was Gandhi's grandson. That was very sensible on their part. Uh, it was obvious because of the number of people who were always with him. You know, I'm talking about 47, early 48, late 46, uh, when already some Sikhs and Hindus from West Punjab had come to Delhi. And also when many Muslims in Delhi were feeling insecure and were being pushed out of, of, of Delhi. So uh, the Muslims of Delhi and the Sikhs and Hindus from West Punjab who had come to Delhi were always with him. And also a great number of uh, people in Delhi regarded him, obviously, as a very unusual man, uh, as a man who could solve the problems they imagined. So I could, I could see, even as a very young fellow, that he, he was an unusual type of man. But when he was with us, he was exceedingly warm and affectionate. And he teased us. We teased him back. Uh, my two-year-old brother uh, was, was fond of imitating my grandfather's way of speech. And that was uh, amusing to him and amusing to all of us. Uh, so he was a very kind of normal grandfather, whom we saw all too briefly. Yes, well, that was, of course, a great shock for the whole subcontinent and the world when you passed away. Um, right, so we can go back to your books and to your writing, and now I would really first like to know how is it that you have written quite a lot of your books and your subject has been Muslims, Muslim leaders, in India. You know, you've written that uh, the Muslim mind, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, various other things. And those have been really excellent uh, books with, with a lot of insights. So how did you get interested in that? Uh, thank you for this question. Yes, I'm very lucky that I had the desire, the inclination, and the possibility of doing some research on these outstanding figures. Uh, Muslim figures, many of them, but I should also inform you, as a, perhaps you do know, Hamidaji, that I've also written a 611-page biography of Vallabh Bhai Patel. Yes. Uh, I've also written uh, a, bi a biography of uh, Chakravarti Rajagopala Chari, who was, uh, your grandfather. He was my grandfather, but he was a non-Muslim, he was a Hindu. Yes. Uh, and I've written a, uh, something like a kind of overall history of, of the subcontinent, which is called Revenge and Reconciliation, mm. where I look at the story of the subcontinent, uh, beginning with the Mahabharat and the Buddha, and I put forward the hypothesis that the Buddha uh, preached compassion and reconciliation, and that the Mahabharata, 
although it contains some wonderful passages on forgiveness and, and so forth, uh, also is a story of revenge and counter-revenge, revenge and counter-revenge. So from the Mahabharata, you might say, there is this strand of revenge in India's history. And from Buddha and Mahavira, there's the strand of compassion in India's history. So these strands are often in tension. So that was a study that I greatly enjoyed working on. Yes. But you're quite right that many of my studies have involved the Muslim figures of the subcontinent. And I think that is perhaps because as I was growing up as a child and my grandfather's assassination, uh, and then uh, the very fact that um, so many people were killed in 1947. I mean, and I was in Delhi and quite a few were killed in Delhi, uh, but not nearly as many as were killed in both Punjabs. So anybody with even a slight sensitivity could not but take in this tremendous trauma. And so I just instinctively felt that I had to understand this trauma for my own sake. It was a very real part of my life. And so it was, I guess, really a process of discovering myself and then finding some use for my life, some helpful role I could play. So it was a, tra a very great privilege for me uh, to be able to research these remarkable figures from different parts of the subcontinent. Yes. Well, it's very good. Lucky for us that you did write these books. And now, then, uh, you've written uh, uh, the Punjab after a yes. while. I mean, yes. so, why do you feel the need to write about the Punjab when, you, when there are so many, there's Bengal, there's, I mean, none of the great states of India or Pakistan actually have proper books written about them. So why did you choose the Punjab particularly? Um, Yes, and before I answer that, uh, Hamidaji, I would like to say how wonderful, generous, large-hearted of Karachi to want many discussions on my book on Punjab. I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, you know, one reason why I felt I had to study Punjab was because so many Punjabis were killed in that year. The, in no other part of the subcontinent were so many people killed within three or four months or so many millions were uprooted within three or four months. That kind of tragedy, the trauma that the Punjabis in all parts of Punjab faced uh, was such a, such a deep thing. And you know, uh, I was going to school in New Delhi. Uh, there were a few Muslim boys in my school, not many. There were a few Muslim teachers in my school, not many. But suddenly, in August 1947, all the Muslim boys disappeared. All the Muslim teachers disappeared. And suddenly, there were uh, Sikh and Hindu boys from Lahore who came to my school. And uh, we had a uh, Hindu Punjabi who came and became our principal in our school. So uh, also, you know, we had some houses. Uh, so there was an Ashoka house, there was an Akbar house, there was a Shivaji house. But suddenly, from one day to the next, Akbar house vanished. And I was, uh, for whatever reason, somehow placed in Akbar house and my house vanished. So all this kind of, these were very minor experiences uh, which uh, represented the much greater, much profounder shock that other people were having. Uh, so it was both my growing up in Delhi, I personally regard that Gandhiji's assassination was really part of the great human tragedy of 47 which killed so many hundreds of thousands the vast majority of whom were Punjabis. So I think this was a factor in my wanting to understand the long story of, 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 of Punjab because I felt that merely to go into what Mountbatten did or what Wavell did, what Gandhi did, what Jinnah Sahib did was not enough, that we should go back a good deal to find out the longer term roots of the tragedy of '47. Did you come up with any answers? Well, that is why I request everyone to read the book. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, no, uh, there are certainly no easy answers, but there are some indications, some indications of, of what happened. But then there is a discussion on the Punjab book, I think, tomorrow, so maybe I should withhold some right. points right. for that. Well, I'll turn to Saran Sari, who is a historian. And, and very interested in the historian of South Asia. Yes. So she has... Yeah, yeah. I'll, I 
just pick up on some of the things that we've just been discussing. As you've said, many of your publications involve telling the story of someone else's life, or in the case of the Punjab, the Punjab's life. And no doubt we've all experienced the satisfaction of when we, thanks to a biographer's skill, the, and their hard work as well, a, a living being walks off the pages that we're reading. There's an immense satisfaction, an addictive pleasure almost, involved in living someone else's past life while we go about the business of pursuing our own in the here and now. As someone once said, and I'll quote, the dead can only live with the exact intensity and the quality of life imparted to them by the living. Now, you are a historian. That's how Hamida introduced you. But you're a historian who writes biography. And that raises, for me, all sorts of interesting possible questions about you know, what the relationship is between history and biography. And the list of biographies or historical biographies that you've written is very long, impressively long. So I'm wondering if you could share with us any of your thoughts on what it is, you know, what's the relationship between history and biography? How far is biography a kind of prism of history, perhaps? Thank you for these very, very important questions. And of course, I would just like to state at the outset that, that biographies offer very, very limited glimpses of history. Yes, important glimpses, no doubt, but I'm always aware when I write my biographies that while they may, I hope, uh, bring to life uh, aspects of a particular human being, they cannot possibly bring to life a whole community, a whole people, or a whole era of time. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, no matter how interesting, how charismatic, how ingenious, uh, how brilliant uh, an individual may be, uh, individuals do not make history. History is made by so many other events, mm. uh, economic events and social events, and, and the interaction of, of millions of people at different levels, interaction of many interests at different levels. Uh, so uh, I certainly would like, never like to imagine that my biography is somehow a portrayal of a period of time or of a country or of, or, or of a province. But undoubtedly, A, some outstanding individu individuals do have a significant impact on their times, mm. and B, uh, even if one person's life is a very insufficient explanation of, of a whole period, many other lives may be similar to that person's life. And therefore, a biography may come somewhat close to an understanding of a country or of a period. When people started to write biographies, you know, hundreds of years ago, they often used to try to extract moral lessons from, you know, those past lives. As we move through time, and particularly as we grow closer to our current time, the, sh the, the focus has shifted somewhat. It focuses more now on trying to uncover perhaps the, let's say, the hidden drives behind individual acts. So I just wonder, in the biographies or the, the lives of the individuals who you've studied, is this at all something that you've sought to do? Or is, have you, in a way, left that behind like many other biographers have? Um, first of all, I'd like to... Uh recognize the fact that no author fully understands herself or himself. No. So uh, what was in my mind when I wrote these biographies one after the other exactly? Did I want to uh, draw out lessons from their life? Uh, did I want to understand them? Did I want others to understand them? Uh, these are complex questions. and I, But I would say that my attempt, uh, irrespective of the other motivations or feelings that existed in my mind and heart, my attempt was to portray as honestly as I could the impulses, the motivations, the drives of these individuals who were all very influential in the lives of their country or countries and to, um, to present my findings as interestingly, uh, as truthfully to my readers, 
so that the readers could make up their own minds as to whether or not there were values in them that are worth absorbing, imbibing. Uh, but passing on values was never a conscious desire on my part. It was to tell a story as truthfully as possible and let the chips fall where they might. Can I pick up on one more point coming from that? Obviously, the people who you've written about, they've lived, in it, they've lived rather in the same period, haven't they? Yeah. They've, they've most of them been born in the second half of the 19th century. Yes. They've died midway or just after the middle of the 20th century. So that must have given you some pretty useful insights into that period of South Asia's shared past. And I wonder if there are any thoughts there that you could share with us. And that is absolutely true, that uh, person after person that I've written about and studied was born in the second half of the 19th century, died somewhere before the first half, uh, before the middle of the yeah. 20th century. Uh, the Hindu-Muslim question was a very important part in many of their lives. Uh, the independence movement was a very important part in their lives. Uh, the social uh, system of India, the caste question was a very major feature in many of their lives, if not in all of them. And the relationship between India and the empire was a very important mm -hmm. part. So Britain and, and the British people uh, are a very major uh, subject of, of my study and inquiries. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, you might say that uh, I have lived now in the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century for most of my life. Okay. <laughs> So you're living your life backwards, yes. in a way. Yes, yes. I know from talk when we chatted earlier today, you were saying that you're working on another biography. Yes. And I wondered if, for the benefit of everyone here today, you could just give us a sneak preview of what this is all about. Uh, this is a biography of a man nobody here has heard about. Yeah. It's a person from the subcontinent, from India, from the Gujarat part of India. Uh, but nobody in today's Gujarat remembers him now, although he was a very unusual man. He belonged to the Patel or the Patidar community. By the way, I'm very, very happy to learn that there are so many Gujarati speakers in Karachi. Mm. There are quite a few I've met here, and I've had s several Gujarati conversations, which I'm so pleased about. But even the Gujaratis of Karachi will not have heard of this man called Darbar Gopal Das Desai, born 1887, died 1951, he was from the Patel or the Patidar community, but he was also unusual because he was kind of a mini Raja or a prince, uh, owning some tiny principalities in what used to be called Kathiawad, is now called Saurashtra. Um, and uh, Darbar in his name uh, is the Gujarati way of saying Raja or Nawab or Nawab Zada or something like that. Uh, he was unusual in different ways, the way he treated women, the way he treated his Praja, his subjects, his awam. In fact, he even gave them rights in some cases to make inquiries on his conduct and if he had crossed a certain line, even to punish him. I'm talking about 90, 1910, this prince giving his subjects the right to prosecute and punish him. The way he, treat, the way he treated the minorities, the Muslims, the way he treated the Dalits, the so-called untouchables, was all very unusual, and his respect for women and his fight for women's rights was quite remarkable. And then finally, he was the only Raja, certainly in the Gujarat part of India, whose estates were seized by the British because he took part in the freedom movement. No other Raja met that kind of fate. And despite this unusual nature of this man's life and, uh, you, you might say, achievements, he is completely forgotten in today's Gujarat. So I wanted uh, today's Gujarat to recall an unusual son of, of their forebears. Thank you. Yeah. That sounds fascinating. Now, you must have known that, you know, recently there's been a lot of uh, a second look, as it were, you know, on the whole issue of partition. And recently there was this play in London, Dividing the Line, which discusses the role of Mountbatten, Nehru, 
and so on in and Radcliffe, of course, it centers on Radcliffe, on the division. Now, when you were studying this, uh, doing your work on uh, partition, let's say, what did you, what did you think was the Radcliffe's uh, role in this? Did it was it just as a stooge? Did he just do as he was told by Mountbatten, or was there any, uh, you know, really uh, mm -hmm. objective? thinking there. As is, I think, well known uh, to researchers and scholars, uh, there is such a scarcity of actual material on what transpired between Mountbatten and Radcliffe. We don't know. There is lots of room for speculation. Some people close to Radcliffe have indicated one or two things, but those things are insufficient to draw firm conclusions. But there is one aspect of the Radcliffe story which I want people of Pakistan and India to recognize. We all say Radcliffe drew the line. Why was Radcliffe able to draw the line? There were four other judges along with Radcliffe in the so-called Radcliffe Commission. There were four Indian judges, two Muslim judges, one Hindu judge, and one Sikh judge. And these four wonderful Indian judges predictably canceled each other's judgment by the verdicts they gave. All of them drew a line. Nobody talks about the lines that these other four judges drew. We, and why was Radcliffe able to draw the line? Because these four Indian judges cancelled one another by, in their judgments. Finally, Radcliffe had to draw his line. Radcliffe was st living in New Delhi when the hearings took place in Lahore. When the finest lawyers were hired by the Muslim League, by the Indian National Congress, by the Akali parties, to present their case to the four Indian judges in Lahore. And the proceedings were flown every day to Delhi for the benefit of Radcliffe. But because the four Indian judges cancelled each other's verdicts, ultimately what we had and have was the Radcliffe line. <laughs> yes, well, obviously, like everything else in, at the partition of India and Pakistan. Everything, it was just not thoroughly thought of and not, uh, you know, all the aspects were not taken into consideration by, by all the parties. And in addition, of course, absolutely so, uh, Hamidaji, but I think it's worth lingering with this fact that these four Indian judges who were judges, they were not lawyers, they were not there to canvass a particular point of view. They were there required to find what was fair, what was sound. None of these four Indian judges said to their fellow brothers, brother judges, can we sit down and f evolve a consensus? Exactly, yes. They knew that some violence, serious violence had already taken place that they knew the likelihood of greater violence, even though they were aware of the enormity of the danger that they were encountering, somehow they preferred to live in their own communal or political cocoons. So this too is something we have to recognize, uh, even for the sake of other similar situations in the future. Right. In fact, I think, uh, and I would like to know what you think, I always felt that the political leadership of India, both on all communities, didn't give enough time to really consider all the aspects of what they were planning. What they, whatever they, they proposed was very ad hoc. And, the, and that's what mm -hmm. decided the fate of the subcontinent. I, I, that is absolutely right. That is undoubtedly the verdict of history, that all the parties involved were rushed into, pushed into, coerced into quick decisions, uh, which is indeed true. But I don't know how reasonable or fair it is to say all the All India leaders fell short. I think we have to take a broader view. And I think as I studied the story of Punjab, it became apparent that a good deal of responsibility also lay on the Punjab leaders of the different political parties. Yes. You see, as, as, we, as we know, or as we should know, uh, 
the Sikhs in Punjab who remembered Ranjit Singh's time, when the Sikhs who were a minority did control all of Punjab and areas beyond Punjab, they demanded very strongly and argued very persuasively before these four Indian judges that two-thirds of all of Punjab, including Lahore, uh, Fazlabad, Sahiwal, and some other areas, should all not be in uh, Pakistan. Likewise, the Muslim League of Punjab demanded that all of Punjab, including Jalandhar, Amritsar, Ambala, Ludhiana, should all belong to Pakistan, even though the Sikhs were claiming, therefore, areas which did not have where the Muslims are in a majority. The Muslim League was, was claiming areas where the non-Muslims are in a majority. So it was a, you know, the passions were strong. Sadly, sadly, it was not a time for calm, reasonable dialogue. They were not taking it seriously. Beg your pardon? None of these people were taking the thing seriously. Apparently not. They were influenced, they were pushed by pressures, by... Yeah. Yes. Well, you're not going to uh, tell us what <laughs> your... Uh, you, yes, one of the questions, which, it's a broad question, so I can ask you even before Gee. the launch of your book, is why do you think you argued that the Punjab Muslims were never able to produce a real leader, political leader, in their history? Uh, well, that, you're now putting some words in my mouth which will bring, bring problems for me in Lahore next time I go there. <laughs> <laughs> I did not quite say that. But I have said this. You know, I start my inquiry in the Punjab book with this question. The Muslims were the vast majority, not the vast, but were a substantial majority in the whole of Punjab, including the eastern part. 57% were Muslims. The Sikhs were only 14%. But after Aurangzeb's death, when the Mughal Empire started to retreat from many places, including from Punjab, there was a kind of vacuum in Punjab. So who filled that vacuum throughout the 18th century? Satraso Saat se Satraso Ninyanvi mein jab Ranjit Singh Raja bane, 92 years of fighting, some kind of lawlessness. Of course, there were invasions during this period from Afghanistan. Ahmad Shah Abdali, also Nadir Shah came during that period. So one question I asked was, why did the Muslim majority in Punjab not stake a claim on Punjab? Why did they not like to control Punjab from Lahore? There were these principalities, there were these Muslim tribes and clans in different parts of Punjab. But none of them, either individually or collectively, said, now that Mughal Empire is retreating, we will fill the vacuum. But the Sikh minority successfully planned to and succeeded in establishing control over the whole of Punjab. So that was my question. And subsequently also, there were other uh, occasions when there were either extremist drives or other pushes or narrow, narrow pushes. Uh, and the Punjab, local Punjab leadership, including the Muslim leadership in Punjab, was very successful in somehow surviving. Most of them came from farming backgrounds. They were yeoman farmers, peasant farmers. Invaders came and went. They had to protect their livelihoods, their families. So ingenuity, survival, pragmatism, somehow choosing the winning side, these became very important values. But somehow, uh, not many Punjabis came together to say, especially Punjabi Muslims did not come together to say, what can we together do to salvage the situation, to bring about some kind of stable rule, just rule, as a nehua. So I have said, I have not said that Punjab has not been able to do it. Can I make one just last comment before we open it up to the floor? I think what's very exciting about what you've done with your history writing is that you don't take much notice of the, the borders, the frontiers that today divide the subcontinent. 
And for me, I suppose, looking at things a bit like an outsider, South Asian history seems very much to have been territorialized. Indians write about so-called Indian history. Pakistanis write about Pakistani history. What would be very exciting would be when Pakistanis start to write Indian history. Indians start to write Pakistani history. And I think what you've been doing is moving in that direction by not taking too much notice of these relatively recent, one might argue, in some ways, the Radcliffe line illustrating this, quite arbitrary kind of artificial lines. So I just wanted to make that comment. But I think probably we've talked enough, at least um, Hamida and I, and we ought to ask the audience yes. if they want to put any questions to you. I don't know where the microphones are. Um, can we have a microphone down at the front? So... Someone over here. <laughs> I think the first hand to go up was in the front row here. Now, can I just, just ask hello, one thing? Uh, hello. So, first, oh, a little okay. comment. Uh, my name is Femi Dariaz. I'm a Pakistani writer. So, you are writing the uh, biography, autobiography, biography of uh, Patel. And uh, about Gujaratis in Karachi that you discovered, <clears throat> there are lots of Patels in Karachi also. You know, if, uh, I wonder if anybody in India heard the name of Rashida Patel, who was the president of Pakistan Women's Lawyers Association. Right? So the other thing is that I wanted to ask was that, well, now that you've been here, and uh, observant as you are, uh, after spending some time in Lahore and Karachi, do you see any chance of normal relations between India and Pakistan in our lifetimes? Do you see it uh, happening anywhere? And the, that, yeah. And the third one was that uh, since you write biography, a book was written about Jinnah in India, I think by a Rajasthani minister, but it uh, really uh, did not uh, capture the imagination of the people. But maybe the time wasn't ripe. But since we wish to, uh, you know, not uh, undemonize each other's uh, leaders, would you like to try your hand on writing the biography of Jinnah? Um, the biography uh, of Jinnah by Jaswant Singh, the one that you referred to, actually was a very successful book in India. It sold many more copies than most other books of that kind have done. So um, I would say that that particular effort was in every sense uh, ideological, commercial, a successful effort by Jaswant Singh. Um, in this uh, book that Hamidaji referred to that I wrote many years ago, which is very inappropriately titled Understanding the Muslim Mind. By the way, that's a title that my publisher chose. I didn't choose it. Uh, how can study of eight outstanding figures be described as an understanding of the Muslim mind, even if those eight were Muslims of different kinds? But one of those eight, of course, was Qaeda Muhammad Ali Jinnah. So that's a, it's a mini, mini, mini biography of about 90 pages. This I had the privilege of working on. But I, I don't know whether I have either the ability or the... Uh, yes, ability uh, to do justice to uh, a biography of Jinnah Sahib. But thank you for even thinking of the idea. I appreciate that so much. Mr. Rajbhun Gandhi, can I, sorry. Just a yes. second. Yes. I think, can we have this question first and then we'll come to you? Ne, uh, ah, no, uh, I, I think he was pointing out that I did not answer the first part of her question. 
Thank you, thank you. So her question was, what possibility of normal relations? Um, I don't know quite how to answer that, but I would say this much that having seen people in Karachi, having seen and met many people in Lahore, to me what is striking is the illogicality, the irrationality, the unreasonable, unreasonableness of the abnormal relations we do have. It's a great tragedy that we don't have normal relations, but it is inexplicable that with such amazing interest, goodwill, warmth, we still don't have normal relations. This is my response to your question. Uh, Mr. Rajman Gandhi, may I have Ajit. your attention? I want to make a clarification. Your school now has an Akbar house, and it also has a Maulana Azad house. Number two, I took five student groups to India on a goodwill tour, and your school played host on, to each of them. In different cities, we went to different schools, but in Delhi, it was always your school. So your school and you, you know, play a very important role in the human relation between India and Pakistan. And I wish it had been followed. Unfortunately, after 2002, when I was out of that school, the tours stopped. They should continue, and they should come from the other side as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Can we have a... I have been associated with uh, the Initiatives of Change, which is one of your uh, main projects. And I brought up uh, at those places that what we need between India and Pakistan and Bangladesh is a truth and reconciliation between the three countries. And that we, all three countries, are in major denial. And unless we really have people genuinely saying it, not just being nice to you or nice to another Indian who comes and says we won't charge you for your fees or whatever, unless we have people actually concretely working on this and not leaving it to the politicians, nothing will happen, at least in my lifetime. And I was also, I was nine when partition happened, and I've been waiting a long time. Oh, th thank you for this tremendous point. I think the point that Nazji is making is that, yes, people-to-people -people relations, people-to-people -people contacts give a very pleasant feeling, but then there are these hard issues, historical issues that have to be confronted, uh, political issues that have to be confronted. Uh, and there are issues that have to be, that we have to learn from, and in some cases learn to go beyond, to put them behind us, we can't forever be discussing uh, issues of the last 150 years over and over and over again. So if there could be a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that takes up the major issues of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, it would be fantastic. But of course, South Africa had one great advantage, that the new government of South Africa was in a position to say that if some people come and make a clean breast of what they did, they will have amnesty. So that was a very powerful incentive for admi admitting uh, the horrible things that people had done. Uh, a, pe a People's Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission will not have that ability to offer complete amnesty. Of course, many of these incidents are now so old that the question of amnesty may not arise. But I think you have uh, you've raised a very major point that in addition to multiplying the people-to-people -people contact, we must prepare teams of influential people who as Pakistanis, Indians, and Bangladeshis will work together to address some of these terrific issues. Thank you so much. Do we have any other questions? There's a hand there. There's one over there. Manmohan Singh Sahab, my name is Jahangir Khan. मेरा कराची से ताल्लुक है आप कहां हैं यह आपके सामने जरा मैं यह आखिर में हूं और बड़ी अजूबे रोजगार टोपी पहन रखा हूं वह हां हां अच्छा तो आपको खैर पाकिस्तान में हम खुशामदद कहते हैं और साथ ही साथ यह कि आप एक अजीम लीडर गांधी साहब के पोते हैं और मेरी भी साबिक जन्मभूमि नागपुर मध्य प्रदेश है 
तो इस लिहाज से मैं तो आपका यानी इंसानी लिहाज से भाई हुआ कहने का मकसद यह है मैं उर्दू में इसलिए बोल रहा हूं कि आप भी उर्दू बड़ी अच्छे अंदाज में बोलते हैं और हमारी कौमी जबान उर्दू है तो हम उस हवाले से और ये इंटरनेशनल फोरम है यहाँ जिले के मंदूबीन भी उर्दू बहुत समझ लेते हैं और कहने का मकसद यह है कि यहाँ अमन की आशा का बिगल हमारे एक अजीम अखबार और चैनल ने बजाया हुआ है और और वहाँ आपके टाइम्स ऑफ इंडिया के ता, ता, ताबुन से भी लेकिन ये बड़ी यानी कसम पुरसी है और बड़ा एक अंदोनाक वाक़ा है कि भारत माता के जो नेता हैं वो हमारा पानी बंद किए देते हैं ये कैसा जुल्म है कैसी अमन की आशा होगी और कश्मीर जो एक हमारी शह रग है बकौल कायद आजम के उसके दरिया पर वो बंद पे बंद बनाए चले जा रहे हैं तो आप जैसे लिबरल और वसी उलकल्ब जोमा से हमारी दरखास्त है कि वो अपने नेताओं को समझाएं कि कम अज कम इंसानी नाते से हमारा पानी तो ना बंद करें I think this is a, a current problem, or may be a possibly a current problem, and we can't. Uh, we really, it's not the forum for that issue. So we'll excuse Mr. Gandhi from answering that if he doesn't want to. But I like your Urdu very much. Thank you. 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 This side, sir. This side. On opposite side, sir. How uh, they? It is there is a school of thought that uh, the subcontinent is historically and naturally divided into two famous valleys. One is the Indus Valley, that is uh, with the Indus River and and uh, accompanied by the five rivers of Punjab, and other is based on the Ganga and Jamna. And it is historically said that the both has its own civilization, and both are. Totally different from uh, one another. Mr. Etzal Hasan, in his book *Indus Saga* and the creation of Pakistan, has given lots of evidence to prove that the current Pakistan is based on the Indus Valley, which is totally different from the uh, India from the current India. So, what is view? What is your view on this? Uh, as Sarah Ansari pointed out, I am a student of individuals. I write biographies. i am not a student of civilizations to ye indus valley aur ganga jamne ki jo ka sawal hai wo usko samajh le ke main layak nahi hu to main to sirf kuch individuals ko samajhne ki koshish kar paya hu sir aap aapke left pe Uh, एक मुझे एक सेंटेंस का कमेंट करना है आपके सुबह की की नोट स्पीच पे कि हम यहाँ के रहने वाले मिडिल ईस्ट से पहले से ही तंग हैं आप हमें फिर वहां धकेल रहे थे तो काइंडली इसको थोड़ा सा रीचेक कर लीजिए मेरे दो एक क्वेश्चन जो है वो की नोट स्पीच से ही रिलेटेड है आपकी जो बात से मैं जो इम्प्रेशन ले पाया मैं ऐसा लग रहा था जैसे कि पॉलिटिशियंस और पॉलिटिक्स दोनों को आप नेगेटिव साइड में खड़ा कर रहे हैं जब मेरा मैं ये समझना चाह रहा हूं आपसे क्या पॉलिटिकल चेंज जब तक नहीं आती सिस्टम में और स्टेट में तब तक क्या आर्ट कल्चर सोसाइटी में कोई चेंज ला सकता है नंबर थ्री गांधी जी की लास्ट वन ऑफ द लास्ट विश थी ऑन फुट जो है वो आ, सिंध सिंध के रास्ते यहां आना तो इज देर एनी इनिशिएटिव ऑन दैट इन इंडिया मैं ये सोच रहा हूं कि क्या ज्यादा मुश्किल है कि दिल्ली से लाहौर और कराची को एक लाख लोगों को लेकर आऊं या आपकी मदद से मिडल ईस्ट के प्रॉब्लम्स को सॉल्व करूं हाँ नहीं वैसे लेकिन आपने बहुत अच्छी बात अच्छी है क्या ये इम्पोर्टेंट बातें कहीं हैं रखी हैं हम सबके सामने पॉलिटिक्स बहुत जरूरी है मैं तो ये कह रहा था कि पॉलिटिक्स और लिटरेचर लिटरेचर 
दीवारें हटाता है पॉलिटिक्स दीवारें बनाता है लेकिन पॉलिटिक्स तो एक हकीकत है हम इसलिए पॉलिटिक्स पे जरूर हमें इम्पैक्ट करना है इसलिए जो यहाँ पॉलिटिक्स को इम्पैक्ट करना चाहते हैं उनको तो मैं बड़ा इनक्रेज करने की मेरी मर्जी है और नहीं तो जो आपने बात कही है वो जोर देती है मेरे उस आर्ग्यूमेंट को कि अगर असली काम आगे कुछ होना है इंडिया और पाकिस्तान के बीच में तो वो आवाम से होगा कुछ इधर उधर नेताओं से या मिनिस्टरों से नहीं होगा सर आई एम कादिर खान सर वॉट इंस्पायर यू टू राइट अबाउट बादशाह खान बादशाह खान वेल वन ऑफ टू थिंग्स आई वॉज ए टेन ईयर ओल्ड बॉय इन न्यू डेली इन द होम ऑफ माई पेरेंट्स माई फादर हैड एन अपार्टमेंट अ फ्लैट ही वॉज द एडिटर ऑफ द हिंदुस्तान टाइम्स उन्नीस सौ पैंतालीस में बादशाह खान और उनके बड़े भाई डॉक्टर खान साहेब हमारे फ्लैट में कुछ दिनों रुके थे तो तब से मेरी पर्सनल रिलेशनशिप थी और नाइनटीन सिक्सटी नाइन में जब वो इंडिया आए और फिर एटीज में भी आए तो तीन चार बार मेरी उनसे मुलाकात हुई और जो इंसान 12 साल अंग्रेजों के जेलों में और 15 साल पाकिस्तान लीडर्स के जेलों में रहा था तो उसकी जिंदगी लिखना बड़ा नेचुरल था मेरे लिए Rubeth Raj the short story writer so send this my soil as my young man asked you question about that you have penned down about Bashar Khan so have you ever written something about late sign GM said who made effort for this continent so would you like to ask well i greatly respect and salute the memory of GM GM Syed Sahab uh i'm honored that somebody wants me to write about sayed sahab somebody wants me to write about jinnah sahab ab main 80 saal ka takriban ho gaya hu to i think some other uh, studies have to be done by more capable and abler people but uh uh i wish i could perform this service it would be a very great experience for me but if it's not does not fall into or on my shoulders i hope that this task will fall on stronger shoulders thank we'll you all, sir we'll all help in this <laughs> we'll provide the materials hello uh, uh, rajwan sir ha ji गांधी परिषद प्रमुख था तो हूँ तब कहू छू कि आप भाषाओं में बात करिए अथवा हिंदुस्तानी अथवा उर्दू के हिंदी में तो अपना पर ना लगे आ अंग्रेजी करता ये तो आपने बिल्कुल ठीक ये तो मुझे दोबारा कराची बुला रहे हैं उसके लिए मैं उन्हें बहुत शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ लेकिन ये कह रहे हैं कि हिंदी हिंदुस्तानी उर्दू में बोलना ज्यादा अच्छा है सही है लेकिन क्या करें अब अंग्रेजी भी हमारी ही एक जबान हो गई है और सारा जी जिस मुल्क से आती हैं वहां बहुत कम है अंग्रेजी बोलने वाले लेकिन इंडिया और पाकिस्तान में बहुत ज्यादा है अंग्रेजी बोलने वाले आपके भाई ने दारा शिको पे बड़ा अच्छा एक ड्रामा लिखा है आप औरंगजेब के वो करते हैं क्या इज देर ए डिफरेंस इन द वैल्यूज बिकॉज आई बिलीव दारा शिको इज अ बेटर एग्जाम्पल टू द सिचुएशन इन इंडिया एंड पाकिस्तान देन औरंगजेब योर कॉमेंट्स प्लीज 
uh, I'm very glad that you have referred to the play in verse, uh, in English verse, by my brother Gopal Gandhi on Dara Shuko. It's a wonderful uh, piece of work by him. My study of Punjab is not about Aurangzeb. It is about the period from the death of Aurangzeb to the division of Punjab. So it is not a biography of Aurangzeb, although of course there is a very brief description of some aspects of his reign. Uh, so uh, it isn't as if my brother Gopal is a champion of Darashuko and his older brother Rajmohan is a champion of Aurangzeb. My brother Gopal is a very good poet also and a playwright. I was just trying to write a history from Satraso Saat to Unniso Santalis. My name is Veer Ji Kohli and I belong to Tharparkar and I belong to the Hindu community and I belong to this country. I belong to the country of Mahatar Bhoomi. I belong to the country of thousands of indigenous people of this land. And there are also Muslim brothers in India who are also living there for thousands of years. जब यहाँ पर कोई ऐसी बात होती है तो इंडिया में जो रहते हैं उनके ऊपर रिएक्शन होता है जब इंडिया में कोई बात होती है तो यहाँ पर जो हिंदू बसते हैं उनके ऊपर रिएक्शन होता है हालांकि वो यहाँ के इंडिजिनस लोग हैं तो ये पॉलिटिकल मामला है या रिलिजियस मामला है तो पॉलिटिकल मामला है ना पोलिटिकली मामला है और इसमें ये बहुत ही अफसोस की बात है बल्कि शर्म की भी बात है Uh, कि वहाँ भी मेजॉरिटी से जो बिलोंग करते हैं वो माइनॉरिटी के हक के लिए लड़ते नहीं हैं जितना उन्हें लड़ना चाहिए और यहाँ भी ऐसा ही होता है तो ये तो बहुत ही अफसोस की बात है और ये पॉलिटिकल सवाल है ये धर्म का सवाल नहीं है मजहब का सवाल नहीं लेकिन आप खड़े हो के आपने अच्छी बात अपने बारे में बताया और अपना अपना पॉइंट रखा इससे मुझे बहुत खुशी हुई है बहुत ही खुशी हुई वेल वी हैव टाइम टू मिनट्स एंड देयरफॉर टाइम फॉर वन मोर क्वेश्चन कौन गांधी जी दिस इज मुही एंड आई वांट टू आस्क यू दैट देयर इज सम रेफरेंस ऑफ लेडी माउंट बैटन इन द पार्टीशन इन द रेड रेड क्लिफ अवार्ड डू यू थिंक है शी सम रोल इन दिस Uh, I have no information on any role played or not played by Lady Mountbatten in relation to the Radcliffe Award. <laughs> well, uh, okay, well that's a... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Though I must say that this play that I referred to, which yes. is, there is a very definite uh, okay. hint that Lady Mountbatten did play a role. But, but that's just a play too. No, no, no. Right. Thank you very much, Rajmanji, for this very interesting, close to the heart discussion that you had with us here today, and it's it's of if of great uh, intimate value to all the people here. I mean, this is. Thank, thank, you, thank, thank you, Saraji. Thank you so much. Thank you.